Welcome back to GEMS Podcast. I'm the founder and host, Miss Genesis Amaris Kemp, and my guest today is Kimberly Weefling. And here's a bit about Kimberly. She helps people achieve what seems impossible, but it's merely difficult. She is the author of the globally popular book, Scrappy Project Management, the 12 predictable and avoidable pitfalls every project faces. Her latest book, Turning Ideas into Impact, is an anthology with 15 other Silicon Valley consultants. Um, A physicist by education, she worked for HP for 10 years, then three years in Silicon Valley startups. She worked in 50 plus Japanese companies and with people from over 50 different countries, helping organizations solve global problems profitably. Kimberly has helped to start, run, and grow many small businesses, including several that are still alive and profitable. Her superpower is turning managers into leaders and groups into true teams who can achieve impossible together. She's been described as a force of nature, and you'll find out why, and is determined to use that force to make a significant positive impact on our world. And today, Kimberly and I are going to spend some time discussing global pandemic of dysfunctional organizations and how to get them to be functional. So without further ado, please welcome Kimberly Weefling to GEMS Podcast. Oh, thank you for what a wonderful introduction, Gem. I am so energized and excited to be with you today. Take took a look at all of the podcasts you've been doing, and I really love that you're committed to authentic discussion. So I've been called the most sincere pumpkin in the pumpkin patch. I'm all into authenticity. Let's do it. Amazing. And before we dive in, we're going to have an icebreaker. Okay. So you can either share something crazy that you've done in your life or a fun but interesting fact about yourself, Kimberly. Okay, crazy. Here it comes. The day I turned 18, I left my home and joined the U.S. Air Force, and I served in the military for two years, 11 months, and 13 days. I really didn't like somebody else trying to boss me around, but I did earn a marksman's ribbon because I'm a really good shot because I grew up in the, in the rural parts of western Pennsylvania hunting with a BB gun and all kinds of stuff. So you might not look at me and think, yeah, she's probably a marksman, but I am. (laughs) Ah, That is interesting for sure. And it was even interesting that you knew the exact time that you were in the Air Force, like you knew it to a T. And I'm like, man, was she counting down to get out of that sucker? I was. I really did not like it. You know, I used to feel really safe living in the United States when I was a kid growing up. And then I joined the military and I said, oh my gosh, people like me, they're getting us guns. We're protecting this country. Oh crap. So it really recalibrated me about feeling safe in the U.S. (laughs) (laughs) Amazing. And you definitely um, are bolstering full of personality just by your pictures, by the colors that's all around you in the background, the colors that you're wearing and et cetera. So we're definitely in for a colorful treat with this conversation. So why are you so focused on the global pandemic and these dysfunctional organizations? And the second part of that question, do you feel like the dysfunction came from all of the chatter around these movements where we already knew there was already problems in these areas? You know, I am a physicist by education and I worked in technology and engineering fields for many, many years. And I never saw a project fail for technical reasons except once. And I said, oh my gosh, why didn't I study psychology instead of physics? It would have been much more useful. And, um, When I look at the research about organizations and teams and why teams fail, listen to the top four causes of failure. It's crazy. The number one cause of failure in global teams, they don't build trusting relationships. Yeah, the first thing we should do is get to know each other, build relationships and build trust. But it's the number one cause of failure. 
And over 80% of teams fail to achieve their goals. And one third of teams globally say, yeah, we're not doing good. So this is MIT research. I love research. I'm a scientist. And then I'm like, well, the second, third, and fourth reasons are we can't communicate, solve problems, and make decisions together. We don't have clear shared goals where the individual and the team goals are aligned. Now, I want to ask you this question. Whose job is it to make sure in a team we have clear goals, aligned goals, good communication, problem solving, and decision making skills, and we have good, strong, trusting relationships? I would definitely say the manager because the manager has the ability to curate the team, but then it's also up to each individual on that team to make sure that there are synergies amongst one another. Oh, I love that. Well, I would say, instead of saying it's the manager, I would say it's the leader. Harvard Business Review today put an article out making a clear distinction that the role of manager has changed, must change. Manage schedules, manage budget, manage cows, but lead people. You do not manage people. I, I go all over the world speaking and I ask, hey, raise your hand if you like to be managed. Nobody raises their hand. <laughs> lead people. So that is all about attracting people. And the way to do that has been known for 30 years, 30 years of research in over 150 countries by the Leadership Challenge, Barry Posner, Jim Cousins, Stanford, sorry, Santa Clara University. It is not rocket science, people. When I tell you some of the ways to do it, you're going to be shocked that we're not all doing it every day. Yeah. Um. Wow, that was a mouthful there because whenever you think about it, I had to like dial back to my corporate um, world experience and I was like, how many times was I managed versus how many times was I led? And where was the difference in my productivity? So yeah, so I definitely like that approach, Kimberly. And with your background of being a physicist and then now you now doing the work that you're doing now, do you think that your background has afforded you the ability to help with the work that you're doing now? Absolutely. I found physics really difficult. When I was a kid, I wanted to be a scientist. Oh, I loved science. I had an Alka-Seltzer powered rocket and all this uh, chemistry set and all. And I studied physics. It was really hard. Sometimes, you know, you work 40 hours on a problem and you don't even get it right. And you take impossible challenges and you can score a 40 some percent on an exam and still pass. <laughs> you know? So I learned in physics to tackle seemingly impossible challenges and go for partial credit and to not give up. And when you look at something that looks complicated, it might only be complex and it might be based on some simple underlying principles that if you understand them and you can adjust them, you can transform the entire system. Okay, yeah. And I definitely say whenever you understand something, you know what you're working with. And then it also gives you the ability to look at the root cause because sometimes people just stay at the surface level and they never go deep diving. But once we actually go beyond the surface level and deep dive to fully connect, then that's where the synergies take place. Yes, absolutely. And I would even say root causes because it's often not one thing that's creating the problems. You know, and of course, the focus on management versus leadership is a huge challenge. But the other problem is everybody in the organization is looking up to the next layer thinking it's their fault. You know, I literally talk to people who work as individual contributors and say, yeah, yeah, we should do this kind of leadership in teams. And they, they say, sure, but it's really our managers that need to be in your workshop. And the managers say, uh, yeah, but it's our executives that you need to convince. And the executives look around and say, the president is the one who's to blame. <laughs> and they're just, and the president blames the CEO and the CEO blames the chairman. And literally in one organization, they were waiting for the chairman to die to make changes. Wow. So then 
you almost can ask yourself, where's the accountability factor? Because it's like each person is jumping over to the next um, line of management or leaders. When in actuality, if we all come together and lead in our respective areas and work from the inside out, then I think it would be a holistic approach. I call it leading from any chair without position, without title, looking in the mirror and asking, how am I contributing to the challenges we face? And how might I make a positive contribution instead of being the helpless victims? Absolutely, because if you think about it, even if you're an IC, an individual contributor, you still have the responsibility to lead from your work area because the work that you're producing is going to help somebody else and it's contributing to the overall um, solution to that problem. And I've been in individual contributor roles and then I've also been in um, management or as you like to say, leadership roles. Um, but the leadership role was totally different when I worked for a smaller mom and pop corporation versus whenever I transitioned to a Fortune 500 oil and gas company, because there's different policies and procedures that are in place. And sometimes some of the things that you do with smaller companies will not be the same with companies that are at the Fortune 500 level due to various um, checks and balances. Are they all right? No. Do I agree with everything? No. <laughs> <laughs> but whenever you aren't the one signing those checks and you are running million dollar wells a day, you better get your butt in line or you're going to get out of line real quick. Well, I think there's a lot at stake in any business. And what people need to understand is that organizations that have healthy organizational cultures based on wonderful, effective leadership that attracts people willingly to followership and great teamwork and high employee engagement, they make more money. Okay, there is no downside. Stock price goes up, profits go up, revenues go up. There's no downside to having a healthy organizational culture that doesn't suck your will to live. <laughs> when you said suck your will to live, all I could think was, a leech um, popping up as a visual representation or a mosquito. So let's talk about some of the things that um, individual contributors or people who are outside of a leadership role can do to really um, showcase that we need to do this together. And it's not just about the people at the top, but it's about how can the people who are at the bottom and middle meet the people at the top. You know, uh, the leadership challenge research for the past 30 years has distilled this down to five behaviors of the best leaders in the world, which is independent of position and title and individual contributors can do it. And each of the five behaviors has six practices underneath of it. Let me give you the easiest one to start with and the least practiced. Encourage the heart. Literally one of the five areas of the best leaders on planet earth is they encourage the heart. What does that mean? That means they appreciate people sincerely. And I can show you a very skillful way to do that. They celebrate team accomplishments. They recognize and reward. And as an individual contributor, you can do that with a simple handwritten authentic note of thanks. And if, that, you know, if that note says, hey, Genesis, is that what I should call you, Genesis? Yeah, okay. Genesis. Genesis, I really appreciate that you are holding these conversations in an authentic way and that you are so organized and the way you set things up and you made it so easy for me with reminders and details for preparation. And I know it's because you really care about the quality of these podcasts and the importance of this message getting out to people that can help to transform the planet in some way for the better through your mission to educate, inspire, and motivate others. And that is who you are at the core. That is so inspiring to me. And that is what I want to appreciate you for. 
Yes, you're definitely going to feel a sense of appreciation. You're going to feel a sense of value, having that thought felt thank you note, or even like a personalized voice note makes a difference. Or sometimes gift cards, like people forget about gift cards, something as small as a Starbucks gift card for somebody who is a coffee lover or a tea drinker, that goes a long way because when people are feel or um, have a sense of feeling of appreciation, then you're not going to have to worry about that attrition. You know, uh, I just was looking at, absolutely right, absolutely right, the little gift card, a voicemail, I have encouraged so-called managers to reach out to their people with a voice call, a phone call, a handwritten note, or a little gift card like that, just to let them know, we appreciate you. We care about you. You know, the data I saw recently said, oh, corporations think people are quitting because of salary and career path and, and things like that. That's part of the reason, but the much more frequent, important reasons, they're totally missing. And the reason is one, my work lacks purpose and meaning. And two is, I don't feel like I belong here. So you got to help your people feel like you belong here. We care about you. You're part of a team and what we're doing matters. It's important. There's a mission beyond, uh, a purpose beyond profit, a mission that matters. And you're contributing to that and then appreciate that. That's not hard. Doesn't cost any money. Yeah, Starbucks gift card bonus, $10, $20. It's not going to break the bank. Absolutely. And I think another um, factor here would be to really look at diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging as a whole. And then also look at, okay, what are your current core values and what is your mission statement? And is it alignment with the new changes that are coming up internally as well as externally? You bring up a great point about values. I wrote a little workbook called Inspired Organizational Cultures that I use in my organizational culture workshops with some of my clients. And the values of an organization cannot be something you just post on the wall. It has to be woven into behaviors, language, the environment. For example, if you really want your values to come to life and support your mission and your purpose and your people, you have to ask, what is it that we would fire our best performer for? What would they have to say or do to get fired? And that is your real set of values. Because if you're not willing to fire your top performing salesperson or your best engineer for violating your values, your values are meaningless and cynicism inducing. Mm, wow, that's a good, that's a good question. Now, I think we need to challenge more organizations to look at it from that vantage point because I don't feel like organizations are. I really do feel like some organizations are out here to ch ch check the box and move on. And why are they checking the box? That is the question. And it's because a lot of it is, you know, money driven and it's tied to the amount of profit that they have. It's tied to what the shareholders want. But are the shareholders the ones that's actually inside the business running the organization? Again, if the shareholders knew how much money they were losing because of poor leadership, ineffective teams and dysfunctional organizational cultures, they would rise up and demand these changes. In fact, some shareholders are starting to realize that poorly led companies with low employee engagement make less money and have a lower stock price by a significant factor. And they're starting to go in and demand changes to the leadership and organizational culture in order to increase their profitability and share price. And then let's jump back um, into your book about the one that you just held up about the organization cultures. When you wrote this book, what was your top inspiration to talk about how can you inspire organization cult, organizational cultures and why the name behind it? Well, I was asked to work with a huge company that's from Japan, but is global and operating in over a hundred different countries. And they said, Kimberly, we want to be one company. We want to be somehow united. 
And so what we came up with was an approach based on stories. So we said, okay, stories from the past, the founder's stories, stories of our legacy, those should really inspire people. That's our DNA. And we want to make sure people understand the DNA of this organism called our company. And they share that DNA no matter which country they're doing business in. Then stories from the present are values in action. Here's examples of people who are living our values that should inspire and motivate the rest of us to embrace these values into our daily practice. And then stories from the future, aspirational stories. Imagine it's 10, 20, 30 years from now. What are the people of the future saying about us? What legacy did we leave? When we're retiring, what will be said at our retirement speeches about how we contributed to this company to imagine together a future that gives us a feeling of meaning, of purpose. And that is so powerful when people share their stories People engage and connect, and it's, it's amazing. It goes beyond borders, beyond language, beyond culture. Just like the Hawaiian islands, they look separate from the top if you're flying over them. Underneath the water, way down deep, they're all connected, as are we as humans. And that's what this speaks to. Mm, okay, so the interconnectivity, and then just going beyond what you're seeing. But really going deep diving in a sense could be, you know, the overarching theme of the book. And I like that you were specifically working with this organization who had that mission in mind and that sparked the creativity and it also sparked the idea for you to put this book together. Yes. And of course, these things look differently when you show up with an outboard motor on the coast of Africa and the fishermen is relying on the reliability of that motor for their life so they don't die while out fishing. It's different from when you're selling that motor to someone who's going water skiing or having fun in a boat. And so it shows up differently in different parts of the world and in different circumstances, but you can still get that common thread of we make a really high quality, reliable outboard motor that contributes somehow to people's lives to the quality of their life and their safety. So Kim, what are some accountability tips or challenges that we could hold our listeners and viewers with? That way they could walk away with this and they could apply it in their own business. Or if you're still in that nine to five corporate setting, you can challenge your leaders and they're gonna be like, wow, thank you for bringing this insight to the forefront. Well, the most important thing for anybody who wants to contribute in the way you just described is what is called in the leadership lingo, model the way. So if you're just listening, you may not get the gist of this, but I ask people, put up a peace sign. Okay, make a peace sign. Try it with me. Put it on your chin. Do it. Put it on your chin right now. Yeah. So now you put it on your chin, but most people put it on their cheek because I'm doing cheek, but I'm saying chin. And what's happening is People are watching us and they will do what we do and they won't listen to what we say if it doesn't match what we do. So the most important thing for anybody is to be an example of what they want to see in others. If you want to have trusting relationships, show yourself trustworthy, make yourself vulnerable, reach out to your colleagues and say, hey, how are you doing really? Or when you meet a new colleague, you reach out and you say, you know what? I'd love to have a walk and talk with you, even virtually. I want to hear the story of your life, starting from birth, whatever you want to share, so we can get to know each other as human beings. I do that all the time. Yeah, tell me your life story starting at birth. Give me the two or three minute version. And only twice have people said, I'm not doing that. <laughs> Some people still talk. 45 minutes after I asked them that, they're still talking because no one has ever listened to them and they want to share their life story. Of course, you don't have to share the traumas and the triggering events, but just give somebody an understanding of who you are as a human being. That's what builds trust. It's called the life journey exercise. 
life journey exercise. And do you encourage people to do this as a solo ex exercise or in partnership with other people? That way that person could, you know, hold them accountable because sometimes we see certain things in ourselves, but then other people from the outside looking in may see higher potentials than we are tapping into. Well, of course, that's just the beginning. Now, the life journey exercise comes from way long ago book by Patrick Lencioni called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. Aren't you surprised there's only five dysfunctions? <laughs> um, but you're talking about an accountability partner. And it's true. We cannot see the back of our own head. We need other people to hold up a mirror and reflect back to us our strengths, our superpowers, Sometimes our little voice inside of our head, you know, that little voice in your head right now that's saying, what voice? It says something like 20,000 things a day. Most of them are negative or self-deprecating. We need somebody from the outside to say, hey, you know what? You rock. And here's the awesome things about you. And then we get back to that encourage the heart thing. And if we also need someone to hold us accountable when we say, I am absolutely committed to keeping my negativity and hyper-vigilant controller at bay, and being more open and sharing power, sharing control with this team. And please hold me accountable. I ask people to do like this. If I break my own promises, I want people to hold up their hand and say, Kimberly, your pills. <laughs> just a, and it's a, just a kind of a humorous reminder that I am committed more to this team and our mission than my personal ego. And I need you as teammates to remind me of that sometimes because some days I'm having a bad day. People going through these times, these challenges that we're facing in our world, they're struggling, but they don't go to their boss and tell them I'm depressed, I'm lonely, I'm isolated, I'm feeling hopeless. They don't tell, but they are. And we need to encourage and support each other. Thank you for sharing that, Kimberly. And I like your um, sense of humor there. Kimberly, your pills. <laughs> um, that's, that's really cute. And so Kimberly, as we wind down, I want you to leave our listeners and viewers with your call to action for this segment and then plug your website and social media handles. Okay. I think it's time for us to start failing if we do fail fail for new and more exciting reasons. Please don't continue to fail for the failure to build trust, communicate effectively, solve problems, make decisions together, not having clear goals that are aligned. Let's fail when we do fail. Fail for new and more exciting reasons. These are completely predictable and largely avoidable reasons. And the solution is so obvious. We need to lead from any chair without position, without title, by modeling the way, inspiring people with a shared vision of the future, challenging the current so-called reality, enabling other people to be successful, you know, make the pie bigger, don't argue over the crumbs, and encourage the heart. Those are the key principles of the leadership challenge. You can find it online. You can reach out for the book on Amazon by Barry Posner and Jim Kuzis. If you reach out to me, KimberlyWeefling.com, it's hard to spell, but don't give up. If you can spell Weefling.com, you can find my website, KimberlyWeefling.com, you can see my work. And my team is called Silicon Valley Alliances, an amazing group of people all over the world who are committed to transforming planet Earth for the better through transforming global organizations committed to doing the right thing for all of us. Check me out on Twitter, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, Instagram, TikTok. You name it, I've been on it. I'd be happy to connect with any and all of you. So on your um, social media handles, Kimberly, is it uh, your name, Kimberly, and then Weefling, W-I-E-F-L-I-N-G? It's usually K-W-I-E-F-L-I-N-G. Sometimes I get feeling scrappy because I'm famous for scrappy project management. So I call myself Scrappy Kimberly. But there is only one Kimberly Weefling on planet Earth. So if you search on Google, you will find me. There is a limit. I think there was some kind of emergency limit on Kimberly Weeflings. They couldn't afford to have more than one because the planet just can't handle it. <laughs> 
Oh, wow. And there you have it, listeners and viewers of GEMS Podcast. You just heard Kimberly Weefling. Once again, I am the founder and host, Miss Genesis samaris Kent, And we talked about dysfunctional organizations during the global pandemic, but then we also talked about how you can inspire organizational culture. So we learned we learned and looked at the pros versus the cons. And we also gave you some challenges. So you could take those challenges and apply it in your business and use it as an accountability factor. So all of the um, team can work together to really create those effective synergies because in order to lead, you must be able to be a leader and you must be able to take feedback and learn and grow together. So until we chat next time, don't forget to subscribe and share this segment. Also leave us a review wherever you're listening. What do you like, what you don't like, and any questions, and I'll be sure to answer those with my guests. And then connect with us on YouTube at GEMS with Genesis Amaris Kemp for all things video content. And lastly, but not least, we are currently looking for brand ambassadors and sponsors for GEMS Podcast, where our mission is to educate, inspire, and motivate while bridging the gap for diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And we are currently ranked in the top 3% globally out of 2.8 million podcasts per www.listennotes.com. So you can find out more to so more information by sending monetary gifts and et cetera by following genesisamarskemp.net. Peace, love, and lots of blessings. Have yourself an amazing day.